Okay, so uh, before we start the lecture, are there any questions, general questions? Yes. Um, so, can you say once again? So, um, we have our, our, our two trees and RF pulse, right? Okay, so let's say I have an RF pulse here, like an RF, whoops, let's see, it's an RF pulse, okay, and then, and then the, there's a slice like gradient, right? Um, and, and then a refocusing so gradient, um, yeah. Like something like this, right? Yeah. So it looks sort of like that, right? Okay, why is there this gap? Yes. Okay. Um, there doesn't have to be a gap. It basically depends on your echo time. So, for example, if you want a very short echo time, you may not have a gap. But if you have a longer echo time, then you're waiting for something to happen. You're waiting for magnetization to decay. So today when we talk about like fMRI, there's, there's advantage to going to longer echo times. So in general, um, you don't need to have a gap. And, and oftentimes, there's no gap. Um, but sometimes, you can have a gap. And then for these purposes, just for drawing it, it was just better to have a gap. Otherwise, it gets all munched up. OK. okay? Any other questions? Okay, um, so today what we're going to do is we're going to finish up our discussion of basic image contrast uh, and then we'll start into more applications. So we'll talk about functional MRI, uh, phase contrast and geography and hopefully get a little bit of diffusion imaging and then next on Monday we'll pick up again and then discuss sort of future of MRI and, and sort of more advanced topics. Okay. So last time we talked about the saturation recovery sequence, which is the basic bread and butter sequence used. And so it consists of a 90 degree pulse uh, followed by an acquisition. So this is your sort of your readout time. So you're reading out the data during this, this red period. And the center of the readout typically, the echo time is defined as when you go through kx equals zero. All right. And then we have this TR repetition time, which is the time between 90 degree pulses. All right. So uh, this is what's called a gradient echo. And you've got the, the image intensity consists of your proton density, your T1 recovery, and in this case, it's T2 star uh, decay. So that includes both T2 and T2 prime decay. Okay. If you stick a 180 degree pulse, then you're going to refocus the static inhomogeneities. You're going to get rid of the T2 prime component, so you'll be just left with T2 decay. And so the expression is similar, except now we have uh, T2. All right. So last time we talked about um, by manipulating TR and TE, you can get different contrasts. Okay. So if we make TE really short, then we get T1 contrast. If we make TR really long, uh, we get T2 contrast. And if we make TR really long and T2 really short, then we get proton density. Right. So are there any questions about that? OK. So this is the problem I asked you to think about. So I'll open up the poll in a minute. And um, go ahead and for this one, you just write down your names and your answers. So uh, using this format here. And so basically, for each of these, for the, the T1 weighted, the, T, the density weighted, and the T2 weighted, just give, you, give me your best guess for what you would put in for TR and TE. OK, you're at the console. You can, can put in the TR and the TE. What would be your best guess to get these different types of images? All right. Go ahead and discuss with your neighbors, and I'll open up the poll right now. Thank you. 
You have a question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, don't 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 stress about it too much. I mean, it's. <laughs> I mean, as long as you're sort of generally have done things, then it's not like we're counting. Yeah. So don't don't stress. Yeah. Yeah, it's just when you put it up. 
Okay, give about another minute. We'll take another minute. So just submit your best guesses, please. Okay, let's uh, take a look at that. So, um, so things are given in milliseconds, so we're going to give the answers in milliseconds. I didn't clarify that, but I'm most of the answers seem like they're in milliseconds. So um, I guess there, there's a tremendous diversity in answers. <laughs> By far the most diversity I've ever seen. So uh, we definitely need to talk about this. Um, so I think that's because we went over at the end of last lecture and the, the retention, the, the, there was an exponential decay. The T2 of, of uh, retention was quite short. So let's, so that's good. Let's go over it. Um, so let's do uh, density weighted first, okay? Because so, that's the easiest one, right? So remember I have a term, uh, you, you want T1 to be as long as possible and T2 to be short, right? So, but the question is, do you really want, uh, so you want TR, so TR to be as long as possible and TE to be as short as possible, sorry. So, okay, so we want TR to be long, right? If TR is long, then the, the, the EXP to the minus TR over T1 goes to zero, that term drops out of the equation. But do you really want TR to be as long as possible? Like, should I make TR like an hour? No. So what would be a reasonable TR to have? Any ideas? How would I decide, should I make it a minute? 30 seconds? What? Throw out some ideas. What would be a reasonable value of TR? What was that? 20 seconds. Okay, how did you come up with 20 seconds? Five time constant. So five times the longest T1 would be 20 seconds. Generally, three TRs is three T1s is generally good enough because you're already at 98 percent. So even 12 seconds would be uh, long enough. And in fact, on a lot of MR scanners, I think 15 is the longest you can do it without special, um, you know, doing special tricks. So you don't want TR to be as long as possible. You want it T TR to be as long as it takes for the thing with the longest T1 to have recovered. Okay. Question. So I don't practically just have uh, like four thousand milliseconds, so like five thousand milliseconds, and then five seconds. Why does that be three times T one? Well, if you're asking for because then that would still have some T one uh, dependence, right? Because if you were strictly speaking, if you don't want any T one dependence, if you have just one time constant, there's still some T one dependence. But at three time constants, where it's recovered basically almost all the way you know, then you can argue that there's very little T1 dependence. So, I mean, there is some gray area. But certainly one is not enough for if you want pure proton density weighting. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, 
Um, so you're asking about the T1 weighted versus T2 weighted? Oh, okay. The density weighted is basically um, how much water is in each tissue. So if you look at the density weighted, you'll see the lowest amount of water is here in the white matter. Okay, so the wiring in your brain has the lowest amount of water, uh, and, and here it's it's seventy percent as compared to CSF. So the stuff with CSF, um, you know, is is these areas here in your ventricles. These areas are mostly pure CSF, and so they have they're most like water. And then somewhat in between is your gray matter, which is you know all your neurons and things like that. So there's water there, but it's not as much as CSF. Okay, so it's sort of like the density weighted just tells you how much basically water is there, how many hydrogen protons are there. T2 is going to be, so one thing to realize is T1 weighted and T2 weighted are never purely T1 and T2 weighted because there's always that proton density term in front. So it's like proton density and T2 weighting, proton density and T1 weighting. But we call it T2 and T1 because it's primarily weighted by those things. All right. So these are the, the, the three most fundamental types of contrast you'll see. So you have, if you go to the doctor and you have an MR exam on you, you'll, you'll most likely have a proton density, a T1, and a T2. Then there'll be other scans you might have that we'll talk about later, but these are sort of the, the bread and butter. Okay. All right, let's look at T1 weighted. So for T1 weighted, uh, what should the echo time be? Do I want it big or small for T1 weighting? Small, right? I want it as small as possible because I want EXP to the minus TE over T2 to be basically 1. So by, ideally, I want T equal to 0. In practice, maybe it's a few milliseconds. It's as short as possible. Okay. What about the TR for this? There was a wide range of answers for the TR for this. So, um, so let's think about this. So we have three tissues, one with the CSF. CSF is 4,000. We've got 1,350 and 850. Okay? So we've got two T1s that are sort of close to each other and one that's way out here. All right? And you notice I do have contrast. Definitely I have contrast between CSF and gray matter, uh, white matter. But I can also see here I have some contrast between, at the boundary between the gray and the white. Okay? And in fact, for T1 weighting for brains, that's what we really care about because we actually want to be able to measure how much white matter and how much gray matter you have. Uh, oftentimes what that's done is people do that to measure cortical thickness. Okay, so how, you know, how healthy is your, is your brain tissue? Typically as you age and or if you get Alzheimer's disease, that cortical thickness can go down. Okay? So, so I have two tissues and I really want to distinguish between gray and white. So what T1 should I pick, or what TR should I pick to sort of give me some contrast between those two T1 tissues. Some, some what close to the average, right? So I really want the average of these two. And the average is, what is it? 250, like uh, 1,100? Is that right? Yeah. OK. So TR equals 1,100. OK? Go ahead, question. Yeah, but the other way to think about it is with a TR of 1100, will CSF have recovered very much? No, so it, it will appear dark as well. So it, it gets everything, right? It's, it's sort of, you pick, you sort of pick what you really care about. And in this case, you know, since you guys haven't really looked at many MR images, it's, you know, you're sort of learning everything at once. You're learning to see what MR images look like, and you're trying to figure out how to make them look like that. So, um, so especially like up here, you can really see the nice gray-white contrast, right? The, the basically, all the wiring goes right up to the cortex, and then there's just that thin stuff around the brain is your, is your cortex. OK? Question? Yeah, that's a good question. So that's where uh, I should have put the slides in for this time. But from, the, from last time, remember, we have two things that are decaying at different rates. 
then the difference sort of occurs at some point. The maximum difference occurs at sort of the average. Okay, so that's sort of the intuition. So for both T1 and T2, uh, if you have two things that you're comparing and they're recovering at different rates, sort of you take the average between the two, that gives you the best, most difference. Okay, that's just a general rule of thumb. Typically what we do, if you actually, when we optimize these, we obviously use computer searches and simulate it and it's a lot more complicated, but for, for now, that's a good rule of thumb. All right, okay, so everyone okay with that? Okay, so T2, Applying the same logic, um, what should the TR be for the T2 weighted? Okay, so what, what do we want for the TR for this guy to be? Based on what we talked about before. 12 seconds, right, is a reasonable thing. Three T1s is three, 12 to 20 seconds would be reasonable. Okay. Um, what about the TE, the echo time? What should that be? So once again, we have one T2 that's way out there, and then these two T2s that are more similar, right? So we know we don't really have to wait, worry too much about that outlier. We're really worried about contrast between those two. So what if one has a T2 of 80 and the other has a T2 of 110, what, what should I put my TE at? 95? Is that the average? OK. OK. And the TR here would probably be 12 seconds. This is milliseconds. All right. So that would be, I mean, obviously there's some leeway in what you pick, but that would be certainly a very reasonable choice of TR and TE to get these image contrasts. Um, that's really weird. Uh, just to clarify. Yeah. Um, is this right to say that TR, which is care about CSF, uh, or takes it with a lot of water, where TE? Uh, you mean for the T2 weighted one? For all T2. Uh, so can you say your question again? Is it possible to just generalize how to find TR and TE by basis? TR, TR is basically looking at how you can capture your CSF if you want a CSF, and TE is the contrast? Um, well, in general, you're not. Um, you're, you're, uh, like if you're dealing with brain, that's reasonable, but in general, you might be looking at some other part of the, of the, um, the body. Um, and, and so in that case, you, you have to think about what you actually want to contrast. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, we'll talk about that a little later, but T, uh, T2 is used a lot for when you actually, I mean, they're, they're actually all used and they give different information. And, and the thing is, they have different responses to like aging and disease. And so they do give you, because they're different, you know, certain me biological mechanisms tend, may change one and not the other one. Uh, but they are, it's all related. And, and so oftentimes, you'll get all three and then try to model the whole system. And in fact, uh, you know, currently radiologists look at T1-weighted, density-weighted, and T2-weighted, but there is a trend towards more quantitative imaging, which the radiologists currently aren't really on board with, but it may be the next generation radiologists gets more on board with, which is just looking at a map of, you know, a map that just shows you the T1 values and a map that shows you the proton density values. These are not quantitative images. These are just still qualitative, right? So I think that's something that... Um, the future of radiology, and then in the future, there's going to be a lot more AI and deep learning in radiology, and that's going to sort of change what radiologists look at. But it's going to take time. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, then you actually have a number. You can actually, these are just like brightness and darkness, but if you actually have a number, so if you have the actual T1 value, then you can monitor it over time. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So let me just talk about some other sequences. Uh, a very common sequence is what's called the flash sequence, which is used a lot for doing very rapid images. And I'll just give you the principle behind this. So uh, primarily, we've talked about the 90 degree pulse, right? The 90 degree pulse, remember, that sort of um, 
it basically, when you tip the magnetization, you have no MCD left, right? So now you have to wait for this T1 recovery before you can tip it again, okay? So that's sort of like if you have like an old-fashioned toilet, right, with a tank, and you do a full flush, right, and you use up all the water in your tank, then you've got to wait for the tank to fill up again until you can flush it again, right, okay? So the idea is that, well, maybe you don't need to do that. And some of you, well, you know, California often has droughts and things, and so there's more like water savings things. And so there are sort of these low flush toilets, right? Or you can put your toilet into low flush mode where it doesn't do a full flush. Maybe it only uses half the tank, right? Or a third of the water. Um, so you can, if you, and that's like sort of, instead of a 90 degree flip angle, that'd be like a, maybe a 30 or 60 degree flip angle, okay? And so the idea is, if you're willing, if you don't need the full magnetization, then you can just tip it like tipping it this much gets you half the magnetization, but now you don't have to wait as long for the recovery. Okay, so it just turns out that 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 is actually a reasonable trade-off that can be made in a lot of imaging. And in fact, given a a, a, a T1 and a TR, there is an optimal angle called the Ernst angle that maximizes your signal for you. All right, and I'm just going to walk you through what it looks like. So. Uh, for example, here is a, uh, let's assume we had a T1 of a second, right? So if we had a 90 degree flip angle, if we had to wait three TRs for some recovery, uh, that's like we have to wait three seconds. So that's quite a long time, right? In this case, this is showing you that if you only wait half a second, um, you get half the magnetization. So instead of full magnetization, you get half the magnetization, but now you can go um, like six times as fast, okay? And if you're willing to go to a lower signal intensity, um, so here you can get down to 100 milliseconds or 30 milliseconds, so you can go super fast. Okay? So these types of images are used where you're willing to make some trade-off between signal and speed. Okay? So if you're doing like cardiac imaging where you really need the speed, you're going to make that trade-off. Or uh, at the beginning of every exam, there's typically localizers, which just are trying to figure out where your head is. And those typically, you want those to be very quick. And so those typically use flash images. So when you go to an MR exam, the first set of images you'll hear, it's just like localizing where your brain is. It's taking very snap, quick snapshots of your brain. So that will be using something like a flash sequence. Okay. Uh, the other uh, type of sequence that's used quite a lot is what's called inversion recovery. And here, uh, it's not as, so here, this one is for the spin echo, which we looked at before. But this is now the inversion pulse. So we add another 180 in. Okay? And the idea behind this is that at this point, we invert the magnetization such that it recovers. And if we wanted to, we could image, have the 90 degree pulse when that magnetization is at zero. And that allows us to null out different species. And um, for a certain T1 and a TR, the inversion time to null out a T1 species is given by that. Okay? So you're not, don't worry about the equations for this one. It's just saying that this is another method that's used quite a lot. So for example, here we have um, different images where we've either nulled out, looks like we've nulled out um, fat here. We've nulled out white matter here. Uh, we've nulled out gray matter here. And we've nulled out CSF here. So oftentimes, uh, this can be useful for like, uh, so something called the flare sequence is used quite a lot clinically because sometimes uh, you may not, you want to just sort of, if there's a lot of fluid and you don't really want to see the fluid, you can just null it out. All right. Uh, it's also used, there's something called black blood preparation where in this case, uh, you can null out the blood but leave the remaining uh, tissue available. So this is used a lot in cardiac imaging. So here, basically, you don't, if, if, if you have the, the, the blood is bright, and then it's going to be very hard to look at the cardiac wall, okay, the heart wall. And you might want to be able to see, ish, uh, you know, sort of um, any problems that might be in the cardiac, in, in the heart wall. So this is used quite a lot for cardiac imaging because then you sort of have a much cleaner image of the, um, the, the wall. So inversion recovery is a really neat trick for uh, sort of helping you visualize things that might be harder to visualize, right? And background suppression is sort of a super duper form of that. And this is actually in your, one of your homeworks, you actually looked at 
this part. Okay, remember you had the 9180 and then you imaged at some point and that you were trying to have the magnetization nulled at some point. Okay, so you can actually just add more 180s. Uh, this is actually a PhD thesis, I guess, 20 years ago uh, from a grad student. Um, and so he what he showed is if you had all these 180 pulses, then you could actually uh, null out tissue over a wide range of T1 values. Okay, so here he's showing that if you have, and this is a log scale, so with just two inversion pulses, you know, you're down to like, you know, you've nulled down tissues over a large range, uh, down to like 1% of their value, and with four inversion pulses, you're down to like 10 to the minus 4. So you basically can kill all the tissue in the background. So where is that useful? Well, if I can null out the tissue in the background, and then I have blood flowing in that's not nulled out, then I can get an angiogram, right? I can see what's, what hasn't been nulled out, the background, uh, the, the, the blood that's not in the background appears and everything else is black. Question? Does that happen because it's the physical matter of the body that gets affected by magnetization? So when you have blood flow that hasn't been, the, the fins haven't been affected by the RF pulse, or by the, I guess by the RF pulse, then you can see that, then you can see that blood because it has, would it, so does it happen that way because the blood wasn't yeah, that's exactly right. So let's say the tissue is here and the blood's flowing in this way, right? So the pulses only affect the magnetization here. I make them selective so they only affect this part. So all, everything here is like just squashed down. So then the, all you see is the stuff that's coming in, which isn't affected by these pulses. Yeah, so that's right. So basically we are, it's basically we manipulate the spins that are in the tissue to null them out and then the tissues that are flowing in are not affected. So when we do the imaging, they appear bright. And so this is an example of sort of a, I guess that's the carotid artery uh, using this method. Okay. Yeah. So for example, if you were allergic to like a dye, you would need to do this MCT if you were allergic to like a dye block. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll show some examples later. So angiography is, non-contrast angiography is used quite a lot, although there is also something called contrast angiography, where you do we do use agents in um, MR to increase the time, you know, reduce the time and increase the signal. But the problem is some of those agents have been found to actually have uh, um, bad effects, especially I think on kidneys and something like that. So there is a push more. The more you can image people without agents, the better off you are. Okay. All right. Okay. So we're going to switch gears now and talk a little bit about functional MRI. So I think everyone knows who this is, right? Okay. So, so far we've talked about sort of anatomy, which is sort of getting a nice picture of the brain. And what we want now is to talk about brain function. So what's the brain actually doing? Okay. So an fMRI uh, setup is basically you put the person in the magnet, and the only real difference is uh, you might have them doing something. So you might have them play poker, doing a gambling task, you know, doing virtual reality, playing video games, just whatever you can think of humans doing, someone has probably done it in the magnet. And I mean virtually everything. Uh, even dogs, they're, they're doing fMRI of dogs now um, to understand why dogs and people get along so well. Okay. Uh, we even tried to image a shark once. So we, there's the, um, that was really hard, but it was, yeah, okay. Sharks are really interesting. It wasn't my research, but I was helping out with it. So sharks um, were the, one of the first, I think, uh, species to evolve the cerebellum, which is this area back here, which is really controlled, responsible for your motor control. And so, um, and shark brains vary a lot depending on their environment. So there's a wide diversity of the geometry of shark brains. So just even the anatomy of shark brains is very interesting. Um, and this was just sort of like one of those things where the guy said, applied to the NSF and said, hey, I want to look at brain, shark brain function. And they gave him money. And so every morning they'd go down to Scripps Pier and catch a shark, bring it up, put it in water, and then at the end of the day they'd put it back, I think. Um, well, it's outside of the shark, and, but you have to have the shark, you have to have the, the water aerated and flowing through the gills or, you know, to keep the shark alive. So it's really, it was really a complicated experiment. Yeah. So was there another question there? Okay. Uh, 
Okay, so that uh, is actually a relatively recent. It was really, um, this is Sage Mababa, who was the one who first proposed the mechanism for fMRI, and this was a paper back in 1992. Um, and so it's, it's about, what is that, 27 years old? So relatively young technology. The basic mechanism, the basic phenomenon in, in this experiment here, they were looking at the MR signal. So this is the MR signal as a function of time. So time is going this way. And what they found was when they turned on the light um, and they measured the MR signal in the back here in the visual cortex, the signal would go up, and then when they turned off the light, it would go down. Okay, so that was the very basic demonstration of that. Um, what they also found was that the signal was T dependent. So if the echo time was eight milliseconds, you didn't really get much signal. And then if the echo time was 40 milliseconds, you got much more signal. Okay, so this was a TE dependent functional contrast mechanism. So fMRI is this, I think this plot goes up to 2014 or 2016. Um, and it's probably more publications per year, but it's, it's a really rapidly growing area. Uh, so like even back in 2016, it looked like there was 9,000 publications a year just from the US alone. Um, and then China is obviously quick, uh, is, is publishing quite fast as well. And, and, and a lot of stuff from Ger uh, the UK, Germany, and Japan. So those tend to be the, the top, uh, those are the top five places doing fMRI right now. But it is, it basically every major uh, psychology department now probably has an fMRI scanner. Uh, so in fMRI, we make a fundamental trade-off. Uh, we are going to trade off spatial resolution for temporal resolution. So for example, if you want to do a high spatial resolution image here with like a one millimeter cubed voxel, so one by one by one, it might take you six minutes, although with the tricks you might be able to get down to four minutes or so. Um, but it's still quite a long time if you think about, you know, what your brain does in five minutes, right? So you know, how many thoughts do you have in five minutes and, and sort of all, all the things it does. So what we want to do is we want to actually be able to capture brain function in much finer time scales. And so in this case, um, this slice you can acquire in 60 milliseconds. You can now probably go through a whole brain in about uh, one second. And, um, but the trade-off is uh, you'll make, um, you know, the voxels will be bigger. So the resolution will be bigger. So state-of-the-art now would be um, 800 milliseconds for whole brain. And actually, we've come a long way. I need to update this slide. The, the voxel volume is 8 millimeters cubed. So it's actually not too bad. Okay, you can do a 2 by 2 by 2 uh, millimeter voxel, whole brain, in less than a second. So that's, um, that's uh, come to sort of over the last 10 years, that's where the technology has moved. Okay, question? Um, yeah, so... The, that's what's showing here. So it's probably gone down from 45 to 8. Oh, no. The, the, uh, the oh for this, for the MP Rage? Is for the For the anatomical? Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, I'll try to show an image for, um, you know, this is, people have tried like 0 0.8 millimeter isotropic, but, um, it just turns out that the, the signal, uh, in the amount of time you have, you're still running up against how much signal you can get. So whether you can, whether it's better or not is sort of a um, not clear. Now, if you go to higher field strengths and, and if you're willing to image like a cadaver, then I, on Monday I'll, I'll bring some, some slides showing you can go to really high resolution. But it's uh, in a human being who's breathing and moving and stuff, you're just sort of limited. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, no, that is being done, and we'll talk about that on Monday. Um, and in fact, the vendors are rapidly coming out with deep learning recon, which basically you know means that everything you've learned you don't really need to know. Uh, <laughs> just let the computer do it. Um, so. Um, uh, so yeah, that is being done. The, the, the tricky thing is, you know, with deep learning, you're, you're never sure when it's going to fail. Right. Yeah. Uh, is the item mode of using the machine learning the flat sequence space where you're getting hot volumes? Is it like reducing the amount of information that's going to be complete, or is it a different 
Uh, you mean for the fMRI? Yeah. Uh, this will. I'll, I'll show you what we do for that. Yeah. Uh, you can use flash, but the the more common sequence we use is this single shot echoplanar imaging, which uh, you saw in your homework. And there's it sounds like there's going to be two projects on this as well. Okay. So uh, this the idea here is we have a flip angle. Could be 90, could be 70, or, or something. And then we just zigzag through k-space using these gradients. Okay? And so that's where we get the speed. We try to go as fast as possible through k-space. So we can, this is sort of also called snapshot imaging. All right. So people have tried to use flash, and there are still attempts to use it. And there's people coming up with new methods all the time. But I would say. 99% of fMRI still uses this sequence because it so, works so well and it's, it's uh, well supported. Okay. So um, typically in an fMRI exam, we will acquire an anatomical because we want to have a nice picture of the brain so we can sort of see where things occurred. But then we'll also follow that up with you know, a sequence of images. Whoops, I need to fix that slide. Let's see. Okay, so typically we'll acquire a sequence of images, and then in, in, let's say in this case, we'll during some of the images we'll maybe have you know no stimulus, and then maybe we'll turn on some stimulus for some images, and then turn it off again. So that's represented here, where for example you might have 20 seconds of flashing checkerboard, you might be off for 60 seconds, and then do another 20 seconds. So this is a very simple design. So the very first fMRI experiments would use this very simple design. We're just trying to sort of stimulate the brain and see if it's doing anything. And so what you might get is a waveform like that. And then what you do is the, the very simplest analysis you can do is you can just take this waveform, right, and you can correlate it with every time series in the brain. So you're basically asking yourself, what parts of the brain went up and down with that timing? And then what you end up with is a, uh, you know, an activation map. And this is showing that in the back of the brain, you know, there was a correlation of about 0.6 or 0.7 with that time course. And so you would argue, so in a lot of fMRI, um, then you would say, well, that, that's the part of the brain that was active. Okay? Now, behind that, there's a lot of statistics, and fMRI is very heavy on statistics and lots of processing. So this is just a very basic uh, idea to get the point across. Uh, and then you can take your activation maps and you can superimpose it on the 3D image, you know, the anatomical image. You can surface render it. You can make lots of cool photos. Okay. There's even, I know some groups actually, after you get your fMRI, after the MRI done, um, when you take part in their study, they actually 3D print the brain for you and you can use it as your keychain or something like that. So that's sort of cool. Okay. okay, so let's talk a little bit about bold contrast. So bold stands for blood. Oxygenation level dependent. Okay, so let's just talk about what that contrast is. Oops. So as we talked about before, one of the, the features of it is is it is echo time dependent. So at forty milliseconds, we see the bold contrast. At lower echo times, like 8 milliseconds, there's, there's relatively little bold contrast. Right? And by contrast, we just mean, did the signal go up in response to the stimulus or not? Can we actually see that? So it turns out that we need to review uh, this thing called T2 star. So we talked about T2 star. So 1 over T2 star is just called R2 star. Okay? And that's the, typically what people talk about. And so the decay has the form of the exponential minus R2 star times T. Okay. So uh, fMRI involves both T2 and T2 prime contrast, but by far most of it is the T2 prime contrast. Okay. And for that reason, most fMRI uses gradient echo imaging. So that means we're going to use gradient echo. Uh, People have tried using spin echo, and it, it has some interesting features, but the signal is much lower, and so uh, people don't tend to use it as much. So just to remind you, uh, signal decay, um, you know, if we have some perturbation of the background magnetic field, there's going to be some dephasing and some signal decay. If we have more perturbation of the magnetic field, then we have um, more uh, 
dephasing and a decrease in the MR signal. Okay, so this slide, we've already seen this slide, I, I guess, in last lecture, so I'm just going through that relatively quickly, but just the concept of how static inhomogeneities uh, can lead to dephasing and signal decay. Question? Yeah, TE is just how long you wait. Okay. So the idea is if you don't wait any very much, there's not going to be much dephasing. Right. The longer you wait, the more dephasing there is. And so that's the question is what's the optimal TE? Well, let's we'll we'll get to that in a minute. Okay? Yeah. That's a good question though. So in fact we'll get to it right now. Okay. So here's the basic thing that's going on in MR. You might have a baseline state where you've got some magnetization and it's decaying with some R2 star baseline. Okay? So it's, it's got the decay shown by that green line. Then when your brain is active, what happens is uh, that R2 star typically decreases. Okay? And so what happens is the signal decay is less. All right? And so you're looking for that difference in that, those two signals. Right? So obviously, if you have a very short echo time, there's not going to be much difference. If you have a very long echo time, they both decay away. So once again, you're not going to have much difference. So it's going to turn out there's going to be some optimal echo time in here uh, that's going to give you the best contrast. And it turns out, typically, the, the echo time you want to pick is you know, 1 over R2 star. Okay? So the average R2 star of the tissue. All right. So we can look at sort of, and, and typically what people measure is the percent change. So it's like the, the, the change in the bold signal over sort of the baseline bold signal. And with a first order Taylor series expansion, it turns out that that's proportional to echo time times R delta R2 star. Okay? So the delta R2 star is just the change in relaxation rate between those two states, and the echo time is, is where you occur. So it does, see, it does say that the change in echo time is, uh, as you make the echo time bigger, then that delta uh, gets bigger, okay? But you don't want to go too far out because otherwise all your signals decay away. So there is some trade-off, okay? So in general, you push the echo time out far enough such that you get good contrast, but you don't go so far out that everything has died away because then you, you might, um, you basically, the percentage change is very big, but it's because you're dividing by zero. Okay, in the limit. All right. It's something you actually you can predict the modeling. Actually, you can actually measure it as well. Yes, yeah, so you can actually acquire the image at different echo times and see how it decays. Uh, that's a good question. Typically, um, what happens is a few groups will measure it really carefully, and then everyone else will just use those values, uh, unless they find a diagnostic reason to measure them in a person. Okay. And the people are always looking for uh, new biomarkers. So it, it is conceivable you would measure it in a single person, but typically, if you're just doing a research study, you just, just do what everyone else does okay. as a first step. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about R2 star. Um, so it does depend on uh, deoxyhemoglobin. And so the idea is, um, so this is like a hemoglobin molecule, okay? So uh, each molecule has four iron atoms. And when they are, um, uh, when the hemoglobin molecule goes into your lungs, it gets oxygen. And so that's represented by these, these uh, red things. And so that oxygen acts to actually shield the iron. Okay, so the iron in the hemoglobin can't really perturb the surroundings. When that hemoglobin goes into the brain or some other tissue, that oxygen is going to get offloaded into the tissue, and that's going to expose the iron atoms. And that iron is now going to perturb the magnetic field. So that's the basis of, of Volt. Right? So now we're just drawing that same picture before. So if there's a little bit of deoxy deoxyhemoglobin, then there is not, there's some dephasing, so there's some decay. And then if there is more deoxyhemoglobin, there's going to be more decay, and so the signal will go down. All right? So that's, so basically, the R2 star has a dependence on deoxyhemoglobin. 
right? And it turns out in the brain that there's sort of an interesting trade-off. So basically, you have two main things to think about. You have blood flow bringing oxygen in, okay, and metabolism that's using oxygen. So you're comp these two competing things, right? So blood flow is going to deliver more oxygen, and so that's going to tend to increase the amount of oxyhemoglobin and decrease the amount of deoxyhemoglobin, right? Whereas metabolism is going to tend to increase the amount of deox deoxyhemoglobin. Okay. So CBF will tend to make deoxyhemoglobin go down, increases in CBF, and increases in oxygen metabolism, which is denoted here as CMRO2, will tend to make metabolism of the DHB go up. So you have these two competing factors. Right? So it turns out in a normal brain, the ratio of the percent change of CBF to the percent change in CMR2 is like 2 to 3. So the brain is set up, has evolved such that the amount of oxygen delivered is more than you actually need to have. Okay. So if I have a 10% increase in metabolism, I'm going to have a 20% increase in blood flow typically, all right, or 30%, depending on what the actual value is. And that means that what, what do you expect to happen with the over amount of deoxyhemoglobin? If there's a 2 to 1 ratio of delivery to usage, what should happen to deoxyhemoglobin? Will it go up or down? Okay, so down, okay. So down, right? Because I'm giving more oxygen than I need, so the deoxyhemoglobin should go down. So if the deoxyhemoglobin goes down, what should happen to the MR signal? It should go up, right? Because there's less dephasing, right? So that's the basic picture you want to have in mind. Uh, so this is a, a cartoon uh, one of my former grad students made up, which sort of summarizes this. So you have CBF delivering the oxygen, okay? Uh, the oxyhemoglobin and the CMR2 using it up, and, and then the blue is representing deoxyhemoglobin. And so if we have an increase in neural activity, that's going to increase metabolism initially, and you're going to have more deoxyhemoglobin. So in fact, in some cases, you actually see an initial dip. Okay? It's sometimes hard to see, but it, is, it does exist. Um, but then once the blood flow kicks in, then it delivers a lot of oxygen, and so now the deoxyhemoglobin goes down, and you end up with a primarily a positive response. Okay, so that is the, the basic bold signal that we work with. And then after the neural activity is over, we go back down to baseline. And how we go back to baseline is still an area of research, but typically at some point you go back to where you started. Okay, so that's the basic idea behind fMRI. And let's just ask, I'm just give you a few questions. We can go through these pretty quickly, so let me just open up the poll for this. So the first question is, uh, the magnitude of the bold signal change will increase or decrease as a function of echo time. So let's do that. Clear and activate. So go ahead and just enter that in. These are pretty easy, so just take like a minute to take your best guess. Okay, so we have about a 20% increase, 80% decrease. Okay, so remember back to our original image where we showed some of the results from Seiji Ogawa where what was, did you see much bold signal at echo time of 8 milliseconds? No, right, it was sort of flat. And then at, as we increased the echo time to 40 milliseconds, you started seeing signal, right? 
So that would tend to tell you that the magnitude of the bold signal change will increase as a function of echo time. Sure. So um, remember, the signal change depends on how much you dephase, right? So if you don't wait long enough, there's not going to be enough time for dephasing. So you're not going to see any change in the signal, right? So therefore, remember we had the percent bold change was proportional to minus echo time times delta R2 star. OK? And that's valid up to a certain point until it becomes meaningless where you know, the signal dies away. But there is, so if you, if you don't wait long enough for things to dephase, there's not going to be any change between the two states, right? Because both states will be all in phase. So you have to wait long enough for one state to get de the dephasing to be different enough. Yeah, but the bold signal change still has to, you still have to, in, there's still an increase with echo time even early on. Because if you go to this plot here, right, if you have two things decaying at different rates, right, the difference is going to look like that thing we saw for T2, right? So there's going to be, so this is sort of ambiguous, but in general, you think of this increasing in echo time until it doesn't make sense to increase it. Does that? Yes, but if they're negatively correlated, uh, Increases, your signal is going to decrease because it's uh, like, but just by looking at the formula. Um, yeah. Okay. So right. So this is the the so right. So the question is the bold signal. We're looking for the bold signal change. So it's always a change between states. Yeah. So the the absolute when we talk about the bold signal, it is an interesting thing. It's it's not really just that signal. It's actually does, how much does the signal change? Yeah. Okay. Um, Let's do one more question. We're not going to do all these questions just for the sake of time. Let's do question three. So let's, let me open that up in just a minute. See if I can find it. Sorry. Where does it go? OK, so this is open for, so just take a minute and take your best guess at this. Okay, let's take a look at this. So it's about 60% increase, 40% decrease. Um, so remember, once again, if I have increase in CMRO2, right? So, and the, the, the question is somewhat ambiguous, I'll, I'll, I'll admit, but no matter how you interpret it, you'll get the right, you get the same answer. So um, 
If I have an increase in the CMR2 response, that tends to do what to deoxyhemoglobin? I should get more deoxyhemoglobin, right? So um, even if I just look at the baseline bowl signal, that will tend to decrease that signal, right? Because there's more deoxyhemoglobin, so that will have more dephasing. Okay. If I think about the functional response, if the, the, the increase in CMR2 increases, but the CBF doesn't really increase, right? then that's going to make that more matched, right? So instead of a 2 to 1 ratio, maybe I only have a 1.5 to 1 ratio, in which case there is also going to be less of an increase in the bold response, right? Because those two things are more matched, right? Okay, so I'm going to have less, in either case, I'm going to have less of an increase or less of a decrease in deoxyhemoglobin, whether it's baseline or functional change. Sure, so let's say, um, let's say I had a 2 to 1 ratio of CBF to CMRO2, right? Just to say, so there's more blood flow than I need, and so uh, there's deoxyhemoglobin goes down by some amount, right? And so the bold signal will go up by some amount. Now let's say the, the metabolism has gone up, but I haven't really changed the delivery, right? So now I'm using up more uh, deoxyhemoglobin um, than I would have, right? So then the change is going to be less, right? And so I'm going to have less of a bold signal change. Yes, question? Um, yeah, so uh, the so this is an in-class problem, so I'm making it somewhat ambiguous, uh, at least for tests to make my life easier and your life easier. We sort of pre-test them to try to make them less ambiguous. Yeah. So it's just sometimes it's good to have some ambiguous questions so that you sort of have to think about it more. Okay. Quest so wait, let's go back here. Yeah. Yeah, the bold signal is the MR signal. Yes. Question. So in this question, we're trying to ambiguously say there's more CMRO2 turnover because of the bold signal. That's exactly right. So if the ratio is, was one, then there'd be no bold signal change. So if nature had set it up such that it was a one-to-one -one ratio, then we ha I would not have a job, okay? Because <laughs> there would be no such thing as fMRI. Okay. So the fact that it's not one is why I have a job and why there's a center for fMRI. Okay. okay. On an example, you say <laughs> let's, let, let's go to the next question, which was an exam question, okay? <laughs> I think it was an exam question. I can't remember it all. So this is actually more clearly stated. So let's do this one next. Thank you. 
Okay, looks like we have total unanimity, so this is a much better question. So it's C, okay? Uh, so yeah, so let, note to self, don't ask the other question next year. Um, uh, so uh, basically, yeah, the coupling goes from 2 to 1 to 3 to 1. I'm delivering more oxygen, right, than I need to. The percentage change oxygen is much more, so I'm going to have a much bigger decrease in deoxyhemoglobin, so the signal is going to go up much more. Okay, so that's, that's correct. Great. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, so just the next part is just talking about some of the applications of fMRI. So uh, it's been a while since I made this slide, but uh, when I did, I was trying to see what fMRI had been used for, and it seemed like it had been used for everything in this cartoon, I think. Um, you know, it, he didn't really, there's, I, as far as I know, there's been no study of donuts in particular, but there are a lot of studies of eating disorders and obesity, and so um, I thought that was close enough. Uh, this is by far one of my favorite fMRI uh, studies, so I'll, I'll just go through this. So this is something done at Caltech where the experiment was this. Um, you are given, you go into the lab and you're given um, like two cups of wine and they're hidden and they're just in like paper, you know, they're in cups or something that are unmarked. And in one case, you're told that the wine costs uh, $90. And in the other case, you're told that it costs $10. And you're asked to rate how good is the wine or how much do you like it. So in this case, if you're told that it's $90, you like it a lot more than when it, you're told it's $10. And mind you, this is exactly the same wine. Okay. So <laughs> this is why these people, you know, Louis Vuitton can sell a bag for $3,000, right? Um, so in, a, in another experiment, they were told the difference was 45 to 5 and a similar um, sort of liking difference. Okay? So then the next thing they did was they put these people in the magnet and looked at an area that's sort of the reward center of the brain and looked at how that area responded. So in this case, they're told it's $45 and here's $5. Okay, so much... You, your brain gets much less of sense of reward, and in fact, it seems like after about seven time frames, you actually have this dip. Okay, <laughs> like yeah, yeah, five dollar wine, and it's really even bigger between here's the ninety dollar wine and here's the ten dollar wine. Um, so this is why they uh, people can sell you things for a lot of money. Okay, <laughs> because biologically, your brain is actually responding to those signals. All right? Okay. So if you get nothing else from this course, just remember that. Okay? Uh, another really cool thing that people have done with fMRI is we're not really quite at the point where we can do mind reading, but it is, is, it is increasing. So what you're going to see on the left is what the subject saw, and then what you're going to see on the right, and this was done probably five years ago, so it's maybe better now, um, is by using the fMRI to recreate what they think the subject saw. Okay, so ultimately we could use this to, you know, read your dreams or read your thoughts. Um, and so just see what it looks like. Yeah, so it's still pretty coarse, but it's, you know, it definitely, if, you're, if there's a person, it can definitely at some point figure out that there's a person, okay? Um, so it's, it's quite dreamlike now, right? It's sort of like how, how fuzzy your dreams are, but, you know, that's, everyone knows who that is, right? No, who is that guy? Who is that actor? Yes, okay. Yes, question. People are sleeping. No, they're watching, uh, they're watching a movie. Yeah, so this isn't dreaming yet, but they're just watching a movie and you're trying to predict what they're watching. Okay. Uh, I don't remember what this part of the thing did. Oh yeah, it, it knew there was a woman there. And yeah, okay, so it was trying to predict what was in the in the scene. Okay. Uh, so pot potentially uh, 
in, in the future, this might be much better, which will be very scary. All right. <laughs> uh, the other thing is uh, there's also real-time fMRI. So it turns out that uh, fMRI can be used for feedback. And so, for example, well, let's just do an experiment now. I'd like everyone in, your, in this uh, room to decrease the, uh, your oxygenation level in your, um, let's see, uh, anterior cingulate by 3%. Easy, right? Not really, because you have no idea what your anterior cingulate is, right? And you don't have no idea how you're going to increase or decrease your oxygenation, right? Now, you might have better luck if I said increase your oxygenation in your amygdala. Does anyone have an idea of how they can increase the oxygenation in their amygdala? Fear, yeah. If you thought about something scary, you could actually increase the oxygenation in your amygdala. Okay. Uh, how about increasing the oxygenation in your uh, insula? Any ideas on how you might do that? Temperature, but what, what, what could you do right now? Sitting here, put on a coat, or you could do something. It's like think of something really disgusting, okay, and that would tend to sort of, uh, you know, trigger your insula, okay. But in general, for for most parts of the brain, we have really I no idea what's in there, right, or where it is, or even what to do with it, okay. So it turns out that if you actually show someone like just a signal, if I if I showed you whether the signal is getting bigger or smaller in any area of the brain, you can actually learn to make it go up and down. Okay, so in this case, the subject was shown this, the signal from this area of the brain, and they were told to make it either go up or down or up or down or up or down. And with training, they were able to do that. Okay? So it turns out the brain is really good at learning things, um, just giving uh, training. Uh, and then we're going to end with talking about, uh, so, so far we've talked about fMRI where you're actually just, where you're actually having the subject do something. Uh, it turns out that um, probably one of the more popular things now is what's called resting state fMRI. And so this is a picture of what the brain looks like when someone's just lying in the magnet. It's just going through different signals and different, you're seeing different patterns. And if you're to stay on any one part of the brain, what you might look at, what the signal might look like is pretty much noise. Okay? But it turns out it's not noise. It turns out that if I took the signal, for example, in green, whoops, let's say this is from the left motor cortex and the blue is from the right motor cortex, uh, the signals from different areas of the brain are highly correlated, even when you're just lying there supposedly doing nothing. And so what you could do is, what you're showing here is, here's where the subject was actually tapping their fingers according to a task. And here we're asking the question, what areas of the brain go up and down as they're tapping their fingers? In this case, we actually have the subjects just lying there quietly, and we just pick one voxel, say, in that region of the brain, and then we ask what other parts of the brain are acting like that voxel. And you get very similar maps. Okay? So it turns out that in the resting state, your brain has this very amazing functional organization. Um, the other interesting story I'd like to tell about this was this was actually first observed by graduate student Broad Biswal in 1995 or 6, I believe. I forget when the paper came out. Um, and no one believed it, right? Everyone said, this can't be true. Uh, I think, I forget how many times the paper was rejected, probably two or three or four times. Finally, they got it published. And it just sat there for like 10 years um, until uh, some other people, including Mark Rakel from Washington University, gave it some better names and figured out how to market it a little better. And now it is the basis of like a billion dollars of, of research studies. Okay, so um, it, it it typically uh, when an adopt when an when a new idea comes out, um, sort of they, they say that initially there's just a lot of resistance to it, and then afterwards it's people say well it was obvious. Okay, but that period can sometimes be quite long. Okay. Uh, so it turns out in the brain you have lots of resting state networks. Here are some of them. Um, so you have one that's the visual network, you have your motor network, you have your auditory network, and you have this thing called the default mode network, which has actually uh, received a lot of attention. And that was actually one of the sort of the marketing terms that really helped this field get off the ground. 
which is there is this, it tends to be that you have what's called the default mode network and the attention network. And so here, the default mode network is centered around this area of the brain called the posterior cingulate. And it tends to be active when you're thinking about yourself. Okay? And then there's another network. So all the areas in, in red are sort of the default mode network. And then there's an anti-correlated network, all these areas in blue, which when the default is going up, it's going down. And those tend to be when you're thinking about the outside world. Right? So if you are sort of like thinking about, you know, uh, you know your future or, you know, uh, maybe some personal issue, it's typically your default mode network is very active. Once you start having to do a task, that default mode network tends to go down and you're engaged with uh, the more attention network. It turns out that you're always going back and forth between these two networks. Okay? As, as you can sort of qualitatively probably guess just by observing your own experience. Um, but it is thought that potentially sometimes um, in certain uh, um, conditions, for example, if someone is very depressed, typically they tend to be in their default mode network too much. Okay? And in fact, it's been found that if you meditate, meditators can actually control their default mode network much better. They can actually just turn it off when they want to. So there is the ability to, to control this network. But it turns out it is probably a very important network. It's probably a lot of what makes us actually human, although they have found it in, in mice and rats, so maybe you know, we're not that human. Um, but it is, um, it is one of the, this, this, this is showing how much metabolism is in the brain, and it is one of the areas with the highest level of metabolism. And also, just anecdotally, some of my colleagues, I haven't been able to track down the reference, but some people have said that there's the amount of blood pathways to that area is really much more than almost any other area of the brain. So it, it, there's almost never a stroke in that area of the brain. Okay. So it does tend to see that nature has sort of decided that that's a really important uh, thing to have. So, um, so this is actually out of the HTP stands for the Human Connectome Project. They scanned 1,200 subjects. And from that, they were able to come up with sort of, at least at so far, the most accurate parcellation of the brain done in, in living human beings. And so this, the ability to just sort of um, measure resting state activity and look at all these networks and to, to see how they're segregated has really pushed neuroscience forward. And I find this, one, this is sort of remarkable. Um, this is something called functional connectome fingerprinting. And, and I'll just tell you what the, the bottom line is here. But the idea is if I could take different subjects, right? And for each subject, I could look at how every area of its brain is correlated with every other area of its brain. And that correlation matrix would be the fingerprint. So for each one of you, I could put you in the scanner and come up with your, your connectivity fingerprint. And then I could bring you in the next day and, and scan you again. And the, the idea is, could I tell who's who just from your fingerprint? It turns out that. Um, uh, with current technologies, including some work that one of our graduate students is doing, with just about a minute of data, I can tell with like 99% accuracy who you are. Okay, so that's pretty remarkable. It just it means that your brains are different enough that with just 60 seconds of data and only actually like 50 different brain regions, um, that's enough to tell who you are. Yeah. Have we done this with animals? Uh, we haven't done this with animals, and um, for one thing, it's harder to image animals than it is humans. Um, but I, I would expect there, there probably is some, but it's not as interesting. Yeah. Although dogs might be interesting. Well, what it relates to is. Yeah, probably, and, and it just says that our brains are all, we all use our brains very differently, and, and how our brains are connected is actually, it is actually a fingerprint. Okay, okay so I think we're going to end there. We're, we're not going to have time to talk about this. So um, let's see. Uh, so what we'll do in uh, office hours today is we'll go, we'll take a, you know, short couple minute break and then start office hours. Um, we'll go over quiz two during office hours. And then there will be a homework eight posted um, either today or tomorrow morning. It's going to have just multiple choice questions, fairly short. It's going to be due Monday at 5 p.m. online submission. And then the solutions will be posted um, 
you know, that evening. So you have a time to go over them. And so that should, that's part of your test quiz preparation. So if you can go through that homework, it should help you with your quiz preparation. Um, and then Lin Chan will have office hours. Have you, tell, have you posted your office hours for next Tuesday yet? So he'll post the office hours. Um, and then I'll get to you in a minute. Um, and then homework five and six solutions have been posted. Homework seven solutions will be posted, I guess, by Monday, right? So you have them for studying. Um, and then homework eight solutions will be posted on Monday. So you have all the homework solutions posted by next Monday evening. And then there is office hours on Monday and also office hours on Tuesday. And then the quiz is on Wednesday. Um, and it's closed book, closed notes. Okay. Any question? For people's answer for the full office hours session, you're going to go into the. Yeah, I'm going to record it. Oh, it's going to be recorded. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, it'll be very similar to last year's. Okay. 